Over 20 years ago, seven local boys from Camden Town were the most successful hit-making machine in Britain. In the early 80s, madness were the Bash Street kids of English pop. In five years, they had a score of top 20 hits while remaining more of a gang than a business. When you get the seven of us together, something brilliant happens. You know, we don't need lots of stuff. We need seven people on the stage doing what they do. There's always something happening, and it's usually quite loud. Our mum, she's so house proud. Nothing ever slows her down, and a mess is not allowed. Although the hits dried up by the mid-80s and despite some temporary departures, the original seven have entered middle age as a British pop institution. You know, I went through a period of saying um, I was an ex madness And then you sort of think, well, you're not, you never are, you know, until the day you die. Madness, yeah, yeah, it's out of control, isn't it? It's sort of a runaway train. You sort of feel like you don't sort of control it anymore, it controls you. The band were drawn together in their teens by a shared love for Jamaican ska music and English music hall. They all lived around Camden Town in North London and the local pubs and cafes soon became the band's headquarters. So here we are in the heart of Camden Town, which is surrounded by canals and railways. And um, all the digging of these canals and the railway sidings was done by hand, and it was all done by Irishmen. Apparently there were 70,000 Irishmen in Camden Town at one point. I mean, all the band I lived, I either lived in Kentish Town or, Hem or Hempstead or the surrounding areas, and Camden was just somewhere you came to meet to have a drink. I mean, there weren't any girls here. <laughs> It was just all old fellas in pubs. We all used to live around here, and that's why we used to come here, because I used to live up, up, up Chiltern Road, Lee used to live over there, and Chris used to live around the corner there. So it was just somewhere where we sort of, you know, I don't know, strayed to. And it was warm. warm. And it was warm, and the roof over your head, 365 days out. And if it got really cold, in fact, sitting here... And when you looked out the window the up there... And we did like find you out. You could see freight these, trains um, going over there, which we used to jump on. So that's right. you we could look out the window there. there. You could see the signal there for the train. Uh, that would mean there's a train coming when it yeah. went up. Train would go over the bridge. We'd run under the what? tunnel, up on the side of the embankment. Up on the train. Quickly have a look where it was going to. Jump on. And did you have any ambitions for a band yourself? Well? I, I didn't. I mean, it was Mike really who. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, he could always play the piano. Then I think Lee got a saxophone. The band first started calling themselves the Invaders and started out playing in each other's front rooms. At this early stage of their career, the band's name and its lineup had yet to fall into place. I mean, they sacked me once, you know, um, because I wasn't taking it seriously for the first, I don't know how long, it may have been three months, it may have been a year. But I was probably more keen on going to football than I was in music at that particular time, which was difficult because the band were rehearsing on Saturdays and. Um, and increasingly I would stop going to rehearsals on Saturdays and go to the football. And in the end I remember reading Melody Maker one day, and I can't remember why, but there was an advert for a, a singer, and um, it was Mike Barson's phone number. <laughs> so I rang him up, and he said, yeah, you know, we're getting a bit more professional. <laughs> The first thing that struck me was Mike Barson, who was very, very determined. He was very single-minded about the fact that he said to me, when I went to that very first rehearsal, we're going to make records, and there didn't seem to be any argument about that, you know. It was sort of couldn't miss, because we had a couple of elements which, um, which nobody had at that time. One was that we were um, we were under 65, and in that period, uh, nearly every band, they were. I think there was a dinosaur period. They called it. 
and um, we were just a bunch of kids, you know, so I thought that's one of our cards in our hand that we had. Well, this is the Dublin Castle, and this is the pub where um, Madness, or the Invaders, as we were called then, got our first residency, which is to say um, we played every Friday night, I think maybe for a couple of months. And it's really, um, you know, if maybe the Beatles... <laughs> Uh, got their thing going in Hamburg. This was our version of it. <laughs> Except without the girls. After Punk had run its course, several young bands, including the newly named Madness, turned for inspiration to the Jamaican rude boy culture of the 60s, which was also adopted by the resurgent skinhead scene that flourished in the early days of Thatcher's Britain. We all had our own fashion. We all basically liked the same sort of music. We all went to the same, you know, we all had the same interests. So, yeah, I mean, it, it was good. We all smoked the same brand of cigarettes, things like that. It, it was a very, yeah, uh, happy time. Good times, yeah. You got punch up there and there. You know, it's all part of growing up. Here we are in Holtz in Camden Town, where um, where we've been buying boots for a long time. This is the, this is the Temple of DMs. We worship at the Temple of DMs. It's and got soul. And the hobnail boot. We'd just been through, I don't know, you know, six, seven years of punk. Um, reggae had come along as well, and white kids, particularly in this country, and white punk kids, had started listening to reggae, and so reggae bands began to get an acceptance, which up until then they hadn't got. And so black music started filtering into the culture anyway. There was a band called um, The Specials from uh, Coventry, and I'd read about them in The Melody Maker, and it was remarkable that they, they weren't exactly the same as us, but they were wearing suits and hats and stuff at a time when... Um, suits and hats weren't in. Exactly. Yeah. And a whole ball started rolling that we had never really envisaged. This new scene found its voice in two-tone, a record label led by Coventry-based band The Specials. Two-Tone was more than a record label. It was a political manifesto promoting a multiracial Britain. Every band on Two-Tone does this song. Madness's greatest hero was the originator of ska music, Kingston's Prince Buster. So much so that they took their theme tune and name from one of his best-known songs. Madness, madness, they call it madness. Madness, madness, they call it madness. It's plain to see they want a piece of me. Madness, madness, they call it gladness. Madness is a good band, man. I mean, nobody tell me that. I, I, I don't, I don't usually say what the next man say. I've own mind, I'm own, own choice, you know, I'm own taste, I'm own flavor. And I consider them excellent band. And they did an excellent job of my music, my interpretation of my songs. The stuff that stood out on radio to me was uh, mainly Motown and reggae. And um, Prince Buster pretty much stuck out. And um, I started writing, taking pieces from various Prince Buster songs, lines, uh, putting them together, and thus, you know, came up with the Prince. Buster, he sold the heat. With a rock steady beat. The Prince was their first and only two-tone single, reaching number 16 in the charts in 1979. But Madness's place in two-tone was beginning to be undermined by a racist skinhead following. 
As the only white band on the label, Madness became an easy target for the National Front, who co-opted their gigs for recruitment purposes. At everyone's gigs when we first started, there were, there were lots of fights. It just wasn't confined to two-tone or us particularly. Um, and because the punk thing was occasionally violent. You know, the way we dressed and everything was reminiscent of the skinheads, uh, you know, before our time, mm -hmm. when they first uh, skinhead fashion arrived, and then ska music, and then they think, yeah, you know, this is something they could uh, relate to. Hey, you! Don't watch that! Watch this! This is the heavy, heavy monster sound! The Nazis sound around! So if you come in off the street and you're beginning to feel the heat, well, listen, Buster, you better start to move your feet to the rockiness, rock steady beat of madness! Madness left two-tone after one single, but they were quickly taken up by another independent label, the Maverick Stiff Records. A few people recommended and said, there's one band that you'd really like, which is Madness. And um, I couldn't see them. So I was getting married, and I just got the idea that maybe they, to see them, they might play at the wedding, really. It's just a kind of a rough idea. And, and to my surprise, they agreed. And that's the first time I actually saw them play. I mean, I think they came to take the piss, really. You know, they saw a record company executive, you know, we'll show them kind of thing. One Step Beyond. I saw that as the first single and a great title for an album. So when I went down to hear the album when it was finished, which was, you know, they did it very, very quickly, they hadn't recorded it, the track. And they all were aware that you know, they hadn't, and that I would be, you know, they, they, they were like that throughout the entire relationship I had to them. They're always trying to pull one over on you, really. You had to kind of get up a little earlier in the morning and think about it, really. One Step Beyond, we didn't like at all. We just thought it was a throwaway, and it was only, we only did a couple of bars of it. We thought, ah, there you go. But we didn't know about editing. Of course, he just took the couple of bars and repeated it. Blast. Didn't get away with that one. As I'd picked something they couldn't see at all, which was successful, uh, they kind of gave me, I became the single picker, so that was, became my kind of job, really. My girl's mad at me. I didn't want to see the film tonight. Their third single, My Girl, reached number three in the charts. Under Dave Robinson's guidance, they moved away from the scar influences of their previous singles and started to develop their own distinctive sound, focused around Mike Barson's unique piano playing. All bands have a kind of a hierarchy that you have to kind of get used to. There's usually one person in the band who kind of controls the group. There's usually a musical person, in this case it was Mike Barson and he was also the melody of the song, so he was in a kind of an unusual role. A very suspicious individual, never entirely. Always thought you had some kind of ulterior motive. You know, so you had to kind of say, look, you know, this is, you know, this is it. I think it would be good for the band. I think also, you know, we'd have a hit. I mean, the focus was always around Mike's piano and everyone would stand around it with, with songs and ideas. And... You know, I'm always amazed, really, how disciplined we were. Someone's actually said, and I'm sure you'll hear it quoted often, that we, someone said that we rehearsed like the German football team, that it was like very kind of worked out and very meticulous. Lee used to always be writing lyrics, yeah. So, um, I mean, often I used to get, um, you know, Lee would give me a bunch of lyrics on a bit of paper and then usually I would write a, I would, I would write a tune to it, yeah, with a little bit of... Dodge, I often had to dodge about a little bit because often it was very incomprehensible the way he wrote. 